Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, hey, hello, healthcare. Hello, LinkedIn. Hello, YouTube. Hello, if you're consuming this right now, if you're consuming this uh, a little bit later on, on YouTube or, or however you're, you're, you're getting to us, we are just thankful to have you here. And uh, it's, it's an extremely exciting conversation. Ed has been a good friend of, of the series. Uh, and by the uh, by series, I, I now mean Hello Healthcare. We ha we now have a name for it. You can listen to us on a podcast later on as uh, on as well. But overall, uh, he, he's come on and talked about digital transformation in the past and consumerism in healthcare in the past. And now we're going to get into something that that all the all these subjects really count. But we're we're, we're going to get into something deep here, which is the the, the patient experience. Uh, for those of us that don't know Ed. And good morning, Trang, uh, Trang uh, and, and thanks for the hello, uh, uh, Mike. But for, for, for those who, who aren't familiar with Ed's background, uh, he's been in leadership and uh, like high, well, like C-level IT, CIO roles at organizations like Cleveland Clinic, Texas Health Resources, and the Advisory Board, and is now Chief Digital Officer for Health and Life Sciences at Tech Mahindra. Uh, so we're really thankful to have you back, Ed, and talk about a lot of the research that you're doing on the patient experience, what you know about it from personal experience, and overall, uh, more about this book that you're writing and more about uh, what kind of education you're trying to get out to everybody. But with that, any anything you want to say to everybody before we get started? Yeah, hey, I'm thrilled to, to be here. I can't wait for this discussion with you and Mike, and I love what you all do with Symphony RM, so uh, let's go. All right, fantastic. So. Uh, Along with Ed, we have uh, Michael Leonard. Michael Leonard is our uh, chief executive officer at Symphony RM, and uh, his background also comes from uh, personal patient experiences, but uh, also uh, tie, uh, tying in the, the, the types of experiences that he's been able to lead in other industries, such as finance and telecom, and helping to bring some of the uh, some of what these organizations have been doing to create great experiences in other industries, bring that thinking and bring that energy into healthcare. Thanks, Chris. I'm I'm looking forward to just handing uh, handing the microphone to Ed. So uh, Ed has a unique perspective, both as a an executive at some of the biggest best systems in the country, but also as a as a patient now in the. Mike, uh, I think you froze up a little bit, but hopefully the internet will be back uh, by the time we get into it. Uh, James, uh, th thank you for the hello. Trang, again, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Ed. Yeah, we're enthused that that you're writing a book that's speaking directly to patients about how to improve their experiences. It's a shift because there's so many books out there that focus on healthcare policy or healthcare history, but not a lot out there about how to deal with like the pitfalls of uh, interacting with a broken healthcare system. Could you talk to us about why you and uh, Ed is writing this book along with the uh, chief information officer at Mayo Clinic, uh, Chris Ross? Could you talk about why you and Chris came together and, in writing this and, and, and what you hope that patients might be able to learn? Yeah, love to talk about this topic. Let me say right up front before I, I forget the thought that this book is uh, dedicated to all uh, patients, uh, with can it can be patients, obviously, uh, any type of patient, but in particular, those with uh, cancer and their families and the clinicians and organizations that treat them. Uh, uh, for this reason, 100% of the profits of the book, which will come out sometime in next year, 100% of the profits uh, from, from Chris Ross or I go to Mayo Clinic to cure cancer. The publisher, we have two publishers. Uh, one is Mayo Clinic Press. They also will will donate all their profits. Uh, and Simon Schuster is involved as well. And uh, But anyways, from our perspective, 100% of all the fees, all the money that's made from a book go to curing and kicking the ass of cancer. Um, so that's that's number one. Uh, the, the reason this sort of came up is both Chris and I, we've known each other for a while. And, and we, you know, at the time I when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, both CIOs of the number one and number two brands in healthcare in the world. And we both were stricken with uh, cancer. Uh, I actually had a, a heart situation before that, which was really weird. And so we're going through the experiences ourselves as a patient and not just a patient like, oh, we broke an arm, but I mean, this like life and death type of uh, patient experiences for both of us. And, and we really learned a lot. And we realized that even though we were at fantastic organizations and they absolutely are, 
fantastic organization. So it's nothing negative about either of the organizations uh, where we are or came from. We realized we're still falling short uh, when it comes to patient experience. And if we're falling short at the world's most foremost organizations, you know, what, what about other organizations? And so we really thought, hmm. And then the other thing we thought was, what have we done? How have we changed as people and professionals uh, having had this experience within our own organizations? And so as we thought more about this, we, we came together and we were like, you know, we should write a book on this. And, and that's yeah, sort of the evolution. But Chris, there's one more twist. I hate to be long-winded, but let me add the, the additional twist uh, to this book. And maybe it'll spawn some other questions. There's plenty written about patient experience. Okay, so uh, it's a hot topic, but it has been for a long time and not much has changed. So we are writing, we flipped the script thanks to uh, people who are helping us with this book. This is being written for the consumer. This book is written to the patient, not to healthcare. I think sometimes we got ourselves a little bit of trouble. We kept writing writing things, whether it's books or, or, or things like that for healthcare. Uh, and healthcare, we haven't responded as quickly as we should. So we're writing to consumers. So this will be a retail book that you'll find in all of your bookstores and things like that. And that's a, a major twist to, to the perspective in which this is written and to the audience. So that is a long, long answer to your question, but I want to make sure I get that all out there and because that might frame up additional questions from the audience. Sure thing, and, and and excited to hear about that uh, about that direct to consumer approach. And I, I think the audience might be excited too, because like you said, a lot has been written about the patient experience. A lot has been written about what uh, what's possible for healthcare, about what's attainable for healthcare. Yet it hasn't moved fully in that direction. Uh, it's 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 been really widely distributed how health systems have, have made these forward moves uh, to, to help these consumers. So a lot of the people here, I think that a lot of people uh, get excited about the possibility of, of, of what can open up. And we're in a time right now that that is ripe for yeah. probably the type of change that, that you're looking for. Competitive pressures are increasing. Uh, people are, are becoming more demanding of uh, the types of experiences that they want. And hey, there's a book coming out soon that will help uh, guide, help them guide that demand too. Yeah. So excited yeah. about all these things going on. Yeah, because you, Chris, you're right. From a competitive point of view, it used to be sort of sort of the right thing to do to have a patient a buds persons or sort of a customer relations departments or you know they were called a lot of different things. They've been around for for many 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 years. We we just added the word patient experience to it in the last you know five years or so. And um, so, so they, so the whole thinking has been around for a while, but you didn't really have to do much because if you were the hospital in town, you know, people didn't have alternatives, but today they, everything uh, that has flipped as well. There's a tremendous amount of disintermediation going on. You've got, and I know this isn't the focus, so I'll, I'll just say this really quick, but just to level set the whole audience, why this is so important. Well, number one, it's so important because it's the right thing to do. Uh, number two, it, it's it's really important because it helps in the healing process when you get patient experience right. But from these other sort of from a business perspective, you now have Amazon coming into your space, your city. You've got Walmart. You've got CVS, all the whole retail, uh, high tech. And then you have payers who now <clears throat> the majority of physician owned practices are in a controlled owned by payers. So complete change. So now it's it's a matter of survival. Uh, I call it survival of the digitalist. You have to get this patient experience thing right. So from a healthcare hospital centric point of view, provider point of view, you, we, you have to nail this. Uh, so it's a matter, matter of survival. That's kind of secondary for me. Again, for Chris and I, it's, it's in our heart just to you know, help others uh, like we've been helped uh, for, with, to make sure they have a great patient experience. So let's dig into like what's what, what's the foundation, what's the guts of of the book that we're we're talking about here. So 
at the beginning of the call, I mentioned Chris Ross leading uh, IT operations at, at uh, Mayo Clinic. Uh, and Ed, your background with Advisory Board, Cleveland Clinic, Tech Mahindra, all these all these different organizations. But on top of that, I know that you're doing a lot of research uh, to, to get to these points too, because I named a lot of large institutions, but there's all kinds of institutions that people are going to be interacting with, big and small community organizations, federally, federally qualified health centers, et cetera. So, since we're we're thinking about rethink, uh, we're we're it's called rethink the, the the patient experience, and I think it might be a good place to start to get into how you define the the patient experience. Yeah, so definitions are always tricky, and I, I, none of us consider ourselves the authority on you know defining patient experience. What I always tell people and organizations is that you need to define it in a way that makes sense for your organization, but everyone needs to agree to it so that so that when you use the word patient experience, everyone in the organization understands exactly what that means. So I don't have a clever definition for, for me. And, and I know with Michael, you know, we, we, we've been chatting. We, we believe we're always in a patient experience. Um, you know, that you have, like, if you said, are, are, am I a patient? I say, yeah, I'm a patient of uh, Dr. Uh, Flesher, Mark Flesher. He's my PCP and has been for quite some time. So I always maintain that relationship because I'm all about wellness and health and stuff like that too. So I always think of myself sort of as a patient. Other people would define or organizations would define a patient experience as, you know, an episode, in an episodic sort of way um, in, and what's your journey like. Uh, so it's, it's a sum of, I think the one thing that everyone will agree on, it's a sum of a lot of different parts. And, and it's important that each organization define it and, and make sure there's buy-in to that definition and that people own that definition. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of my perspective on it. And you you mentioned uh, that you're the in the book you kind of flipped the script. Uh, what are the key if you're if it's okay to share them? Yeah. What are the two or three kind of key takeaways from the book? What are the things you learned as you as you did your research and, and flipped the script? Yeah. So on the on the research part and and how we came about with with a lot of the ideas. We know Chris and I both come from big health systems and not everyone does. We, we get that. And we know our patient experience, while very important and intimate to us, it doesn't scale to everyone. So we, we realize that. So we, what we did is, is, is some research. It's definitely not a research book, but, it, but we did do some research. And also we did a lot of focus groups. So we did focus groups with patients who, who weren't cancer or heart patients, but had some other uh, tragedy or difficult things, challenges happen in their life and in their journey. And so we did a lot of focus groups, in, including special special groups that that may have not had the attention in healthcare that they need to. And maybe that's something we can touch on a little bit later. Uh, and then we also did focus groups with with healthcare executives from other organizations that aren't, you know, multi billion dollar academic research teaching organizations. So. We, we met with individuals from federally qualified health centers uh, to 100 bed hospitals to 300 bed hospitals, the whole continuum. We tried to get everyone's input and we tried to see everyone's perspective. And it was, it was quite, quite interesting, the different ways that patient experience is defined, because that's a question we asked as well. And again, it goes all across the board and what their challenges were and what is some of the unique things that they're doing. So we, we did that. So it's not just two person's opinions, because we realize also we are in a certain demographic that doesn't scale, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we understood that. So we purposely went out, out, out to get other demographics and make sure that we captured, you know, a uh, full representation of the populations in which we serve. So with all that, yeah. So some of the key things, key takeaways from the book, some of these may not be surprising, but it actually, you know, we have evidence around it, which is really interesting. The, a key factor for a quality patient experience and outcome is not your uh, is not your sort of because sometimes we think this like if you have a, a really good attitude you know you'll make it better than if you had a bad attitude i wish that were the case right because that'd be easy i hey, just have a good attitude i'm gonna kill this thing you know and 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 it turns out that doesn't that's not much a differentiator but resiliency is and resiliency is a little hard because it's not like something you can say, have a good attitude. And you could kind of probably work yourself up to having a good attitude. But resiliency is like a lot more subtle. It's more like uh, caught than taught. 
Uh, so resiliency was, was really key. So those who there's correlation between those who are more resilient uh, tend to have a, a better outcome. Like how do you deal with adversity? So, so it's something that can be caught. And so we talk about it in the book. It's a little bit different. It's because it's so it seems so theoretical. Again, it's not like a skill that you just, you know, practice, 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 and you get. But if you can practice resiliency in your life, you know, how do you deal with a traffic jam? How do you deal with, you know, I'm giving you a very simple example, but how do you, you respond and rebound really makes a big difference. Uh, that was key. Another one is that you could have a great patient experience in a bad hospital and you can have a bad experience in a great hospital, right? So just because you're at a marquee brand, as an example, or as it could be a small hospital that's really known for, you know, their consumer focus, uh, doesn't mean that you're going to have a good or bad experience. So, so it's helpful if the organization has a culture around patient experience, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, and then maybe one other is that having a model uh, to help your patients. So again, we're writing this from to the consumer. So I'm sort of flipping the words a little bit to answer the question. Um, but if you have a model that you can help your patients with, that will help them be more successful. So in the book, we do we do share a model for the patient. Uh, and we can go into, into that uh, a little bit later if you'd like. But we have this model. There's like five, five pieces and parts to this model. And so hopefully people who read the book will come to your organization with this model already. But if they don't, there's nothing wrong with you as an organization saying, hey, here's a model. It's You can adjust it, you know, that's not, you know, uh, hard and fast, but here's a model and, you know, we can help you through some of these steps. So those are like three takeaways from the book. You get this model that can help. Uh, you can really focus on resiliency for yourself uh, and, and then realize, you know, from more of a uh, both a patient and hospital perspective that just because you're going to a marquee brand or a non-marquee brand doesn't mean you're going to have a good or bad experience. So yeah, th that really stands out. And I, I think a lot, a lot is resonating uh, with the audience as well. I'm, I'm really thankful to hear from folks like uh, Lacey, who, who agrees with this, this mental model approach and uh, Daryl, Daryl Schmucker a little bit earlier shared his own experiences as ca a cancer survivor and ultimately how this uh like how important it is to focus on the the consumer experience and and how to arm people on uh how to interact with the, this this healthcare system um a, a question that a, a question that comes to mind though when you, when you mention resiliency uh do, do you have any uh kind of stories around like when I'm, how do you identify resiliency within yourself and what uh what is a step to to increase that because I, I imagine not only important for healthcare purposes but also a lot of other things that people might be uh, trying to accomplish. Yeah, you know, I I said it's caught not taught so much, so it's it is a little bit difficult. But we are going to be very practical in the book on this uh, particular topic because it's so important. So I, I just think about my my own family. So my dad is escaped uh, a, a concentration camp during the Holocaust. The rest of my family got gassed in Auschwitz. And, and then my mom went through, uh, my mom was also in Germany at the time, and uh, she, she, she was bombed every day, and her dad was in the German army and got killed on the Russian front shortly before the end of the war. And, and then she just, she had a hardship growing up. And then even at, at, when I came into the world and with them as my parents, my mom suffered terribly uh, uh, from uh, severe arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and some other maladies ultimately cancer for several years. And so I just kind of learned from my parents. They didn't never blamed someone else like, oh, woe is me because, you know, I got put in a concentration camp, lost all my family, or my mom never complained about, you know, why is she sick and, you know, all those kind of things. I just saw them as resilient. And so I sort of learned the same thing. And then when I came to the United States, we came when I was 10 years old. And I, I'm giving you kind of maybe sort of silly examples, although, although they're not silly because they really developed that resiliency and try to get to a practical point right after it. But like when we came over, we were German all the way through, through and through. And we came over, we wore lederhosen, you know, like if you think Sound of Music, that's how we actually dressed here in, in the United States. And kids made fun of me, man. I, I was picked on uh, mercilessly, 
I can't even say the word uh, <laughs> properly because it's because English is my third language. And um, and so I had to be resilient too to to, you know, as a 10 year old junior high kid to like, all right, how do I rebound from that and, and still become successful and not let that like uh, ruin me or anything like that? So and I did. And then I had a trouble. And uh, when I went to the army, uh, as I was a combat medic at first and eventually became a combat engineer officer. And when I went to basic training at age 17, I, I that's the first time I've ever saw someone that wasn't white. It was the first time I ever ran into people that were different than me. Uh, and so I almost got booted out. So I had to be really resilient. You know, so I just kind of learned. Uh, it was sort of caught. And, and so I think that helped me. So when I had, you know, I had this heart attack, it's like, what, how can I have a heart attack? I'm like, uh, literally a top 1% in my age group, um, for my sport, as well as for my health, according to the statistics given to me by the clinicians. And it's like, why am I having a heart attack? Well, okay. Well, I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to be resilient. Uh, the heart, the, uh, cancer too. How, how did I get suddenly get, uh, cancer like and really you know uh, with a prostate cancer they don't do stage three stage four but it's about the equivalent of stage four cancer it's like a hot wait but i was like no i know i'm gonna i'm gonna conquer this is just a bump in the road you know it wasn't an attitude although i'm sort of expressing attitude it was really this sense of resiliency so i i just share it with you my journey so you can kind of maybe relate to what i'm saying uh in some way uh these different examples so so in life i think and again this is really hard because it's not a skill that you can do one two three or a cookbook but it's like start watching people who who bounce back, who are resilient and start absorbing uh, their life lessons or, or if you know them personally, like hanging out with them and and sort of learning on on maybe their mental, uh, how they handled it mentally, the, what, what they might have said to themselves, how they bounce back, didn't allow them to get themselves in a funk, uh, but and not blame people but take ownership. And that goes to the first part of the model, uh, which is really around self and self advocacy. And, and that's really key because it goes back to resilience. So that's why we really hit on resilience because you have to be, you, you can't, you can't blame others. You can't spend all this time in this funk, but you have to take ownership It's like, all right, I got this. Uh, I got this heart attack or I got, you know, uh, this terrible uh, prognosis or diagnosis. And all right, so I, I am going to take a hold of this and I, I'm going to do something with it and I'm going to I'm going to bounce back again. It's very close to attitude, but it's, it's different. Hopefully I'm able to articulate the subtleties uh, for you. So it's really important that you become your your self advocate, Chris. Um, so hopefully that answers sort of the question. It's a tough one. Resiliency is a very tough one to uh, to define. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great answer. And th there's a theme around it like hey it's not something that you can just uh go on buzzfeed and look at a list of top five things to do right but uh if it, it, you you created a theme about creating an environment for yourself or surrounding yourself with other people who are resilient and i just have a, a little bit of uh, a, a thing that that people could try that this really helped me out was uh I, I do a lot of runs trail races and stuff like that but if you flip the script and actually volunteer at like a trail race or a marathon then what you end up seeing especially like when, when you're, you're providing aid or providing food or what have you to people that are uh 20 30 miles into a run and you see them in that state and there's something that that just rubs off on, yeah. from you if you're doing that yeah, that's a great example and that's what i mean by caught not taught uh, that, that's a great example. The other thing you can do, you know, I talk about a lot about self-advocacy and sometimes you can't advocate for yourself. You're really sick. You're unconscious, you know? So in the, in the book, the, the second part of this model is what we call the village. And it's really important that you develop your village before you need your village. And, and this, and they all, they all work together. Cause if you have a village, you're a pretty good self-advocate. If you're a self-advocate, you've got a village. If you're not a self-advocate, you probably don't have much of a village is what we notice. It's not exclusive, but kind of notice it. Then you're really in trouble. If you depend on your hospital or health system to champion you through patient experience, it's going to be suboptimal. We all know stories. I could tell you stories. You can all tell stories of, of how challenging it is. Right now, I'm dealing with my dad. My dad is 87, you know, the Holocaust survivor. We want him to live as long as he can, telling his story about escaping uh, the Nazis, you know. And, 
And so he went through this uh, big surgery, cancer and like three surgeries in one, like neurosurgery, brain surgery, cancer, skin. Uh, it was like huge for an 87 year old, especially. He's at a really good system, really good health system. But I'm telling you, if I wasn't there or it's my brothers and sisters who are also in healthcare, if we weren't there connecting the dots, doing the care coordination between different surgeons, between the hospital, between the lab, between the, the radiology, I cannot imagine. I, 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 I would be careful. I don't want to say that the outcome would have been tragic, but I think we do get tragic outcomes for lack of good patient experiences. Uh, I have no doubt. And I just think of through my dad's situation right now, I just came back yesterday actually from where he is helping him. So my brothers and sisters, we all take turns. And fortunately he's doing much better and he's on the road to recovery. But I'm telling you, if we weren't there connecting those dots and advocating for him, like, you know, I'll, I'll give you one quick example and, and then we'll, we'll move on. I wanna talk a little bit about how you do the village though, because I think it's a great takeaway for anyone listening. So um, if, so he had an appointment for a CAT scan for his brain to see it, you know, two weeks post-op and then to see the neurosurgeon. So we go and they're like, oh, you're not on the schedule. You just go directly to the neurosurgeon. So I go up to the neurosurgeon and I'm wheeling my dad around, you know, and, and they're like, we need the CAT scan because, you know, we can't, you know, see inside, <laughs> inside your head. And so uh, most patients would have left because they're, the next available appointment is in two weeks. But I know enough to go down there and say, hey, we need a stat. And they did it. And, and so, and then had that not worked, I would have probably tried to pull the card. Hey, I'm, I, I work in healthcare and you know, I'm, uh, I'm from here or there and, and tried to do that. And if that didn't work. I knew who to call at this health system. I could have called the CIO. I could have called the CMIO. I could have got, but most people, 99% of people don't have that. So it, it's so critically important. So the village, so th this is another practical, you know, uh, Mike, you asked earlier about some key takeaways. Maybe this was, you know, even one of the more important ones is to develop your village. And I'll give you an example. So my wife and I were thinking, uh, hey, you know, do we have, are we surrounded by other couples who can help us uh, make us better, make us a better partner to one another, make us better people? Um, and yeah, maybe if someday something goes wrong, they're there by our side. And we realized we didn't really have that. So, so we, we said, we're going to develop, we call it the Texas 10, which actually has since gone to 12 and includes someone from Oklahoma City. So I don't know what we're going to do with the name Texas 10, but it's called Texas 10. So we identified five couples that we thought could help us get to the next level in our just journey as people. And, and so we reached out to each of them and we said, hey, this is our plan. And they're like, oh my gosh, I, I love this. This is perfect. And, and we made sure it was diverse. If you saw a picture of us, there's like, two, three, uh, three white people. And then everyone else is from other cultures, you know, from Asia, from Africa, from other parts of, you know, of the world and they speak different languages. And so it's this great eclectic mix and different religions, a great eclectic mix of people who have our back, who are taking us to the next level. So I guarantee you, in fact, yeah, in fact, I know that like when I was going through um, my situation with cancer and having this radical prostatectomy, that they were there for me. They held a party before I left. They prayed for me. They cared for me while I was going through it. They cared for my wife. Uh, I can't imagine going through this journey without it. So when I described this one time to someone, this is how we got the Oklahoma couple. It's kind of funny. These two doctor friends uh, from Oklahoma, they heard about Texas 10. They're like, we have to be in that and we'll drive down to Dallas. Where, where these most of these people live and where we want to be part of this community. And I'm telling you, you have to have that community because sometimes you can't advocate for yourself because maybe the weight of your, your diagnosis is so heavy or the burden is so heavy, or maybe you're incapacitated is so heavy. You need other people. So it's really important that you develop this village. And, and I don't think most people have it. So, because if I said, Hey, tell me the four, uh, maybe for other people it won't be couples, but four individuals or six individuals that are right there for you, you know, list them out. And so in the book, we actually give practical tips, like write them down, contact them, uh, create community. So we actually meet every two weeks. So uh, it, during COVID, it was all virtual. So we got on Zoom call, we all had our favorite drinks in hand, and we go deep, really super deep conversations on everything, contemporary, uh, some, some maybe older topics, hard topics, um, 
uh, again, I, there's no time to go into all the detail, but I think you can get to where I'm headed. These are deep, deep, deep relationships, and most people do not have them. And so, so it's really important that you have it because when you have a health crisis, and we all will, uh, you need to be surrounded by people who will love on you, care for you, and advocate for you when you can't for yourself. So that's just one practical example of, of, of this model. So make sure people can self-advocate and what that means and how do they do it. Make sure they've got a village around them that that's going to help them. And, you know, the village, let me just say this one last thing, Chris, and I'll stop talking because I, I go forever because I'm really a uh, big believer because I've seen it work so many times, including myself, is your family is not always your village. All right. So um, if they are, that's good. So I'm fortunate that I can count my family and I'm talking maybe your brothers and sisters, your parents, uh, maybe nieces, nephews, um, but not everyone can. So don't, don't default to an answer that says, oh, I don't need that, Ed, because I've got my family. Okay, that's good, but in addition to your family. And for many people where family, for whatever reason, strained relationships and those sort of things aren't necessarily those sort of uh, individuals, then, then you, you supplement with, with the others. So have both ideal situations. You got in your village is family and these other relationships. Uh, have both, that's the best. But if not, you could definitely be very intentional on 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 developing those type of relationships I just described. So I, I wanted to comment. Uh, well, first of all, Ed, thank you for for sharing uh, all those stories because I, I think that when we hear about the types of things that we need to do to be able to cope with the challenges of the healthcare system, it kind of it, it highlights not just for the uh, patients, what, what they need to do, but also to healthcare leaders who are also very often patients, uh, what, uh, what, 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 what are the specific things that we need to address within the system? And I, I wanted to thank the, the, uh, the, the folks in the audience as well, especially Trang Doe shared a story uh, about how a little bit earlier, uh, her, when her father passed away, it was a, a kind of a diff it was difficult to share the, the last moments of that experience within the healthcare system. But get, I want to I want to dig in dig into uh, like kind of the result of a, of a lot of things that you're talking about and the fact that there are all kinds of within this audience there are people who are change makers there are uh, people who are leaders within healthcare there are people who have influence or or help make policy so if they were to sit down and read this book and uh, they're they're looking for that type of inspiration or wisdom like what what kind of change uh, or what what kind of work would would you hope that this book inspires people at that leadership level to do within healthcare systems? Yeah. So, well, first, I'm sorry about uh, the individual whose father passed and didn't have that time um, together, you know, in person because of COVID. Um, so we, we did add a chapter in the book. It's in the addendum. You know, I don't know what the title is going to be, but it's going to be like, hey, listen up, healthcare people, because <laughs> because, again, you know, this is written to the consumers, but we, we realize that that there might be a few people in healthcare that might want to read it and figure out, okay, based on all of this, you know, what can we do uh, better? So, so one thing will be the reiteration of the model, you know, help, and it doesn't have to be our model. We're not, again, we receive nothing. We receive no financial benefit from anyone adopting our model, but it's a model. And maybe there's a better one out there, or maybe it's just a good framework that your health system can use, hospital can use, and make it your own. You know, maybe this doesn't make sense. Maybe change words or change the model or whatever. Maybe it's a good starter set. So giving, empowering your patients, because a lot of them don't know. They don't know that, uh, you know, maybe they should cultivate, you know, strong relationships with people uh, that, you know, and the one of the benefits of that is it can help them. They don't know about self-advocacy. They don't know about, you know, the third one, the third thing that we talked about uh, or when I talk about the model is the team and the team is the exact same thing as the village, which is, you know, again, your family and your, your friends, uh, plus the clinical team in that they can, they can be involved in as part of the clinical team and make decisions. And so a lot of health systems are starting to do that, right? Shared decision-making. So again, I'm just answering your question, question, Chris, the first thing is, you know, have a model and here, you know, you can use it, you can adopt our model or, or change it however you'd like. And, and then the second thing, and it kind of comes out of the model, is this concept of making sure the patient has a voice in the clinical team. And if the patient can't, for some reason, you know, include a member of their village. Uh, you know, a great example is a couple of days ago, you know, I pulled together all the, the care coordination people at where my, the facility where my dad is, 
and I included uh, one of my sisters is sort of the official representation representative representatives from our family uh and and so included her in that conference uh that we had and then we kind of have input into the process and what are the best next steps and so some some hospitals are doing that already uh but but we take it one step further and and when i talk about patient advocacy you know we're trying to empower and you know i hate use that word but we're, we're trying to empower the patient to say you can take charge so i'm going to give you some practical examples uh, and and so hospitals have to be comfortable with this. So back to your question, Chris, you know, what are some things you could do? And that is gain comfort with allowing your patient to lead. So so Chris would give you an example how uh, someone came in and a clinician and, you know, wanted to, it had to do with the NG tube and, you know, doing a certain procedure. And Chris said, no, you're not going to do that. Um, and he gave the reasons why the clinician was insistent. And most patients at that point, even before that point, would have capitulated and allowed that procedure to happen. But, you know, we had to respect, the clinician had to respect the wishes of the patient. And, and that's indeed what happened. Another example is, uh, is where, and I don't want to get too specific on this example, but it's a real example where, where, where the clinicians will do anything, and rightly so, you know, it's part of their oath and why they got into it. They'll do anything to save, you know, your life. Uh, but then the patient may have their own wishes in terms of quality of life, and there's a trade-off. And so the patient may say, again, I, this is a real example, but I can't get too specific. Uh, the patient would say, you know, if if you open up and you you find the X, Y, and Z, just close me back up, and I'm going to just live the rest of my life, however long that is. Uh, but if you only find X, Y, go ahead and take out X, Y. But I'm not going to walk around uh, or not be able to walk or fun have certain bodily functions or something like that if, you know, if that's what ends up the, tr the journey ends to be. So let the patient make that decision. And, and I think in the past, you know, patients are so afraid of the white coat and no matter how much we, 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 even the white coat person may say, you know, what are your thoughts and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's more than that. It's really telling the patient, look, this is your life. And you're the one that has to live it after you leave our facility. So, you know, we will give you counsel on what we think is best, but ultimately they've got to make that decision and own it. And so, and that helps with resiliency down the road with the outcome as well. So that's really important, but we still have a culture today that largely is, I, I'm the clinician, you know, uh, whatever I say is right. And we all know examples where it's not, that's not the case, where someone may have a diagnosis of X and had you followed that and not questioned that, you would have done something radical that you didn't need to do, but you challenged them. And, and so we encourage this whole concept of challenge, respectful challenge. And, and so again, back to your question, Chris, trying to bring the answer back is you need to help help make sure in your organization that you allow for respectful challenges. Because we heard all sorts of stories in the focus groups where respectful challenges were made and the clinicians just, you know, uh, created a really ugly situation as a result. So it's, it's a cultural shift that needs to happen. So, so that's another thing. The third thing, and this is just general for anything, is radical leadership. We we tend to sit around in these meetings and we don't want to rattle the cage. And so we might know what's, or have a great idea for patient experience. And we might not say anything because, you know, four out of five of our peers, you know, want to go this direction. And so we just placate and, and don't take that radical leadership approach. And so I, I say, even if it costs you your job, um, I say be radical, you know, in terms of advocacy, it's not just like this nice thing. Hey, we've got someone here with the title of patient experience. So they're, suddenly, you know, the, the person who can only make these decisions and direct the, the future of the organization when it comes to patient experience. Uh, I don't believe in any of that. Uh, I, I respect the person, of course, but they don't own the, all the wisdom and, and things. So I, I would just say radical leadership in terms of, you know, really advocating uh, for the patient and, and making sure that all of their needs are, are addressed and, and we do change the culture. Because again, my Chris, whenever people push back on me, I say, what have you changed in 20 years? Um, not much, really. Um, so we're still talking about it. We're still behind other industries when it comes to experience. So 
so it's not working fast enough. So be radical in, in your, your passion and your pursuit to help change the culture of the organization. That's what Chris and, you know, that's what happened with Chris and I, we were like, oh my gosh, we need to make more change. We're going to try to impact uh, more change because we've, we've lived it, um, you know, directly. We've heard the stories for years, but now it's us. And if we struggle, uh, then that means that a lot of other people are struggling. You know, Ed, the, uh, we're, uh, this conversation is going great, and there's so many, so much engagement, so many questions. Um, I feel like uh, uh, one one that really stood out, like Lisa Coleman was asking about uh, patient education overall, and and it feels like there there's kind of an alignment between what you're talking about in terms of patient advocacy, like uh, from from the healthcare village perspective, and and the patient. Do you do you feel like uh, that uh, that that the patient education piece is a linchpin role in um, in, in helping people better manage their care and, and create their, those better patient experiences. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great comment. And yeah, I wish I, I, I can sort of see, I don't, I don't want to be distracted. I could see the feed coming down a lot of uh, good interaction, which is great because, uh, I, I hope that all of you are more, even more passionate than all of us, uh, to make, make change happen and then it will. Um, so yeah, patient education, we cover that as well. That, that is definitely something back to your, question, Chris, that that organizations can do to help empower the patient, help empower the village. Uh, so it's really important. But again, encouraging, you know, right now, a lot of organizations subtly discourage patients from doing their own research and education because there is a lot of junk out there right on the Internet and we think we're protecting them. But man, if, if they have an interest and are motivated to go do some research, let them go do it. And even if they find something that that's not real and you have to address it, you know that that's fine, but at least they're engaged and they're they're caring, and you don't want to put a put a stop on that. So, and there is a lot of valuable uh, material out there from a, a variety of health systems and various companies uh, that can be very helpful. So you don't want to discourage that. So do, you do need to provide them with education, but also let them know that they can go beyond what you're providing them, and and maybe you give them some. You know, give them the Mayo Cle Mayo Clinic uh, has great content, Cleveland Clinic and others have great content and just encourage them to, to do some of that research on their own as well. So uh, Michael, I wonder, wonder if you had any thoughts on that as well. I, I think Ed's doing amazing. I don't want to grab the, the microphone here. I think Ed, uh, thanks for all the comments, the insights. I, I'd love to have you keep going. And I, I saw one or two questions Ed, about, you know, what role can the health system play in helping cultivate villages for people who don't have them? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's obviously online forums, there's social workers. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it goes back to the education and you can, again, whether you, you use the model that we will be sharing with the world or some other hybrid. Um, yeah, I think you can definitely encourage that. And, and yeah, I think the focus groups and things like that are good, um, as an alternative, not as a full alternative though. So they're a good supplement but not quite the village that I have in mind when I speak to you all about the village. And that's why if, if they don't have one, that's why we're writing the book for consumers, because we want them to think about these things and take action before they ever need it. Um, so once they're a patient and they're in a tough situation, it's going to be hard, not impossible, but harder to start building on that village. Um, so we encourage you to, to try to Cult, you know, hopefully with all the patient experience tools that are out there and digital front doors, hopefully you're reaching your communities already and just for wellness and things like that. And one of the topics could be you could have a, a webinar or however you want to do it, you know, hey, on this whole concept, whatever language is best for you to use, but how to build this village and then give examples. But I, again, these are these are groups of people with really that are doing real tough conversations because we realized when we started to build this village concept, that it takes what i don't know i'm making this number up 10 years to develop really strong tight friendships and so we were all thinking like how do we accelerate that process of deep connection so what we did is every two weeks which i mentioned we meet we spend an hour and a half together and that's outside of maybe informal times that we have together or maybe some, you know two couples are with each other or whatever um and and our conversations are deep like they're about uh death uh, they're about like the worst thing that happened to you, you know, and people might share, you know, I won't go into it, but, you know, very deep tragedies. And you get to learn people really quick. We talk about 
um, you know, contemporary thing, racism, social equity, really deep conversations uh, that have accelerated these relationships to where they're like super tight now. We don't all agree on everything. We're a very eclectic background, I mentioned. So anyways, uh, yes, um, you can help your populations, your cities, the people that you serve by encouraging to develop, you know, these sort of relationships now before they ever need it. Uh, but definitely the focus groups are good. Hanging out others with others like me is good. But but then you're the only downside, but they're very good. So I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying the reason you want the village, the only downside is that they're all, they're all in the same situation that you are. And uh, and so you, you want to be also surrounded by people who aren't in your same situation uh, for different perspectives and different strengths. So we... We're actually well over time. I almost doubled the time. Uh, but uh, the conversation is so engaging, and the uh, like. There's so many questions that I, I, I would go, keep going for two hours. But uh, I, I wanted to throw. Uh, so Lisa uh, uh, responded. Lisa Coleman, with regards to patients who end up doing their own uh, own research and potentially end up in the wrong places. It's it's a big risk, a big threat uh, that that I see and agree with. And um, I just wanted to point out, we, we recently did some research uh, at Symphony RM uh, conducting a survey across 1,200 patients. And, and one of the questions was around whether or not that patient had heard from their provider about COVID-19, of all things. So it, the, the unexpected result was that, they, that, that only 50% or around 50% of patients had uh, gotten some, got, uh, heard, heard directly from their provider, provider yeah. about it. And uh, that, that's the, the troubling part about that is that one thing that we noticed at the onset of COVID-19 was that click-through rates on emails, click-through rates on websites, like healthcare, like visitations to, to healthcare websites and things like that went up significantly. So what it, it, it's telling that uh, people have been desperate, people are often desperate for some sort of, uh, source of information somewhere. And there are a lot of health systems that were extremely proactive about it, about, uh, about like bumping up their communications. But at the same time, there are other health systems that like, oh, we have this scary crisis. Maybe we should, should uh, dial down our communications. Well, now it's kind of illustrated that there, there's a big cost to dialing down those communications. And it, it, it like basically uh, th there was a word, I, I forget the company that, that, that used this word, but they said infodemic, like we have a pandemic and an infodemic out there. And uh, I think it's important to look at the healthcare system as kind of a communications arm to consistently get the message out there, get the right communications out there. So yeah, people are going to do their own research, but if, you, if, if the health system is constantly putting out information about uh, you know uh, about the right choices and the evidence and research backed uh, concepts, then then hopefully uh, there there's an opportunity to take an edge in this infodemic that we're kind of fighting too. Good point. But w wonderful question, uh, Lisa. Uh, so to to wind things down, I, th I think a lot of the reason that a, a lot of people are here is because. A, a, a lot of people are focused on. I want to grow the consumer experience. I want to do the right things. I want to. I want to make sure my 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 patients are heard and advocated for. But they run into blockers such as, well, it's a very complex problem we're solving, or it's disjointed. The technology's not there yet. All that kind of stuff. We've heard that stuff for years. And as you said earlier, there's been a lot of stuff written about it, but uh, the needle ha has has only very recently been moving forward, and and not by enough. So what would you say have been the real blockers? Like, like what has blocked people from being able to drive this innovation and, and, and how, like for these motivated, enthusiastic people to overcome it, what, what can they do to overcome these blockers in their organizations? Yeah, so I, I would say that the, I think the tools are, are, are there and not like what, what you all do uh, in the, knowing, the, knowing your patient, giving them choices. It's just think about, you know, your experience in other industries and we can replicate that. In healthcare, there's no doubt about it. So it's not really a technical thing. You know, there's great solutions out there, and and you all do great great work um, helping organizations uh, with this. Uh, so so some of the it's really cultural. Um, it's a lack of uh, bold leadership. Uh, so I know you asked me these questions, Chris, and you know you're going to get sort of heretical answers from me. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't mean to hurt people's feelings or anything, but that, that's what I've seen. That's what my experience has been is uh, we have too many uh, points of no uh, in organizations uh, and too much fighting within organizations. 
Uh, and so we might have this great idea for patient experience, but you know, the CFO disagrees or the chief strategy officer disagrees, or maybe a, a key clinician disagrees. And so we don't move on it. We, we, and, or by time, you know, you have this great idea for patient experience. And by the time everyone gets their cut at it saying, no, 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 no. You're then left with just this little bit of improvement, incremental improvement. And I think that's what we've seen. I think we've seen incremental improvement, but nothing like major. So I think it's bold leadership where, you know, at the CEO board level, you know, is like, we, we need to learn from however it's decreed, you know, we need to learn from other industries, you know, pick whatever, pick Starbucks, you know, who, whomever. And, you know, Starbucks knows me better than my health system does. Uh, so that's why I, I say Starbucks. So um, make sure, so whoever is the right Amazon or, you know, you've heard them all, but, you know, let empower someone uh, to make those decisions. And of course you have to be collegial and work with others, but don't, not to the point that you, you lose any of, it becomes impotent. So we, we create these structures, right? Chief patient experience officer or, you know, all these structures and they become impotent because again, we all culturally, we just strip away all the ideas and, and so nothing happens. So long-winded answer to say, uh, bold leadership is probably the most important one because you got to break through this, these cultural barriers. Yeah, I wish I could be more practical, but that's like that's the biggest single one. Well, Ed, you said something there that I, I think is you know, really powerful and overwhelming. So you, when you say Starbucks knows you better uh, than your health system, Starbucks has probably two to three orders of magnitude less data about you than your health system. Yes. So it's not that they. It's not that the, the health system couldn't know you better. It's it's that they haven't figured out how to convert all that into making you feel known better. Um, yeah. And that is a challenge. I, I tweeted one time just as an experiment. I don't know if Chris, I've, I've mentioned this before or not, but I tweeted one time. I said, I said, American Air, because I fly American, American Airlines knows me, uh, Marriott knows me, USAA, which is a financial services organization, knows me, but my healthcare, and I'm not going to tell you who I tagged, uh, do you know me? And I got responses from everyone except for my healthcare organization. And uh, it was funny, even Brawny. I, I remember one time I, uh, there was something with Brawny, like we accidentally ordered, you know, this was during the toilet paper crisis. Uh, and we accidentally ordered, uh, by the time the order came in, we, we ordered eight cases instead of eight rolls or something, I can't remember. So I, I put out some funny things about Brawny and Brawny responded. And, and uh, anyways, these other organizations uh, know us, but healthcare doesn't. And, and it's and and Michael, that was a great point. Healthcare should know us better than anyone. One because of the sanctity of our health and wellness, in you know uh, reaching out to us at our our deepest darkest uh, hours, typically when when things aren't well, um, and they have all the data. Uh, but but for whatever reason, we haven't we haven't well for the reason we saw at the very top. You know, uh, we didn't have to do anything, so we didn't do a whole lot. But I think I think we're forced to change now. So so that's the good news on all these new dynamics and district mediation that's happening is you're you're forced to change. If you don't change, you will be assimilated. You will be assimilated. That, that that's giving me Star Trek vibes. <laughs> I've got to tell you, uh, I saw that tweet. I'm not going to name any names, but I just dropped your uh, Twitter handle down. Uh, like uh, for, for for folks that aren't following Ed on Twitter, follow him on LinkedIn as well. But on Twitter, you get like a uh, bite size every morning. I, I don't know if you're doing this on a timer, Ed, but every morning I, I wake up to a brand new inspirational uh, but challenging tweet. And I, I, I love it. Uh, so uh, strong encouragement for everybody to follow Ed on Twitter. Uh, so, so, Ed, as, as we uh, get into, I mean, there, there's a reason you wrote the book. There's a reason you and Chris got together, and there's a reason that you even came on and spoke with us today, knowing who would be on air and, and listening to us. And uh, I just like to finish things up with with knowing what you think after this conversation. What should people think about, uh, or what what should people kind of learn about over the weekend now that we, now that we've had this conversation? What what would you say would be a final thought you'd want somebody to take away from this? So a real tough one is we have a moral and ethical obligation to do something. So we, cause we know we are, we have, we're actualized in the sense that we know how important this is. Otherwise we wouldn't all be on this call. Uh, we, we've, we probably have some level of influence in our organization. 
So we therefore have an obligation to do something. And, and that's how Chris and I felt. It's like, oh my gosh, now that we've had this experience and know this, we, we can't hold on to it and just keep it to ourselves or, or just within our organizations. We got to share it more broadly. We got to make things happen. So I would just say to you, because we, we are all actualized, again, just by the fact that we're here, we realize how important this topic is, that uh, we each uh, go out and, and do something. I don't want to do this rah, rah, you know, sort of like this motivational thing. Uh, so that's not my intent. But but I just want to say, you know, we're, we if if we can't make it happen for all of our brothers and sisters and our parents and our grandchildren and all that kind of stuff, who's going to do it? You know, we... Who, who's going to do it? Is some some person out of the sky going to come in and do it? No, it's it's each one of us on this call. And, you know, maybe our influence is this much or this much. But even if we just help a 10 patients in our organization or, or 100 patients, it, it could literally, and we alluded to this earlier, save someone's life. And uh, and if not, at least have them given the dignity of death. You know, that's the other thing we didn't touch on. But patient experience is, yeah, I want to save people's lives. And we gave an example on how sometimes if you, you're not that self-advocate, you lose. Um, but also ensure a great experience, yes, but also a great experience in the dignity of death. Uh, I think everyone deserves that. So we're, we're, we're in the know, so let's take action. I appreciate that, and I, and I appreciate that uh, it's not just a rah-rah speech going on into the weekend yeah. uh, because the perspective, the, the angle that you're coming from is being a healthcare leader, working with another healthcare leader, major health health institution, and uh, I mean there, there were experiences that were that were crushing, and you and you mentioned things about uh, experiences going on now uh, that that like if your family and if if the village wasn't established, then I mean it, it, it could be a much worse outcome. So. I can't thank you enough for, for coming and, and being so transparent about these experiences. Yeah, and, and the last thing, Chris, since you mentioned the village, go go and do that list. I challenge all of you. Oh, I don't know what the magic number for us. It was a Texas 10 for you, maybe 12 or five. It may not be couples or maybe some singles, some couples, whatever. doesn't matter. I was just encouraged diversity and uh, and then reach out to those people and ask them to be in this sort of relationship um, and, and have your first meeting, lead those meetings, get deep. And, you know, uh, it'll change on many levels, not just patient experience, but it'll change your life in many ways. Well, and I, I just want to add, I love the way you said that. And I can't, uh, you know, Chris was talking about from some health systems, the vacuum of communication, right? I can't tell you how powerful it, it would be or would have been in the past if, uh, if a health system had reached out to me or a family member and said, hey, a critical part of your care is your village. Yeah. Right. You know, make sure you think about these things as you construct your village or as you reach out to people to help and I think as we get to value-based care, it'll be really interesting to see if, if some of the payers, if some of the big value-based care providers start to think about why, wow, if this village concept is right, if this helps with better outcomes, then we ought to be out there advocating for it. And it, yeah. it's a powerful message. Because who's going to care about you after you're discharged? And now some, some physician offices will call you. You'll get a survey. That's what you get. <laughs> That's patient experience. You're going to get a survey. And uh, who's really going to take care of you, though? It's your family. It's your village. So, and that's going to going to keep you healthy. Uh, I, I didn't do a study on it, but as we're talking, I, I can imagine that you know readmission rates. If you had a village, would your readmission rate decline? I wonder. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to steal actually from uh, Mark Schiffman here on checking in and uh like, like you said hey you get a survey that's your patient experience but what about checking in and, and seeing how people are doing uh like, like asking a, a, a set of questions to make sure that there's uh compliance engagement understanding of care and i i think that's extremely important i'm going to flip it a little bit by by saying that i uh I, I really felt like i did get that experience when i went to uh walmart health and uh, it was just a primary care visit. I went there just to uh, test it out. And I also very much needed a primary care visit. I, I, I'm not compliant. I, I was not going every year like I should have. Uh, but I, I received check-in calls before and check-in calls after. And that just really kind of lit, uh, lit my eyes as to what these uh, organizations that are obsessed with consumer experiences, how they're operating and how they're acting. So you can actually, uh, we, we did a uh, podcast last week 
uh, on Hello Healthcare. You, you go to hellohealthcare.com or you can go on your Apple podcast or wherever you get your podcast. And uh, the question that we asked was, will retail health eat traditional uh, traditional health care? And um, spoiler alert, the answer is no. But uh, there, there's there, there's a lot of people that we talked to uh, that that kind of highlighted highlighted the experiences and the, and the new and, and interesting things that that these organizations are doing. So uh, if you want to check out the podcast, uh, you, you can go. I'll, I'll drop the link down and uh, down below. But Ed really wanted to thank you for the uh, for for coming on. Um, next week, if, if, if this village would like to join us next week, we'll be discussing with, uh, Dr. Kavita Mishra, who's actually a uh, fellow of transgender medicine at the Cleveland clinic. And we'll be talking about, uh, disparities in care for, uh, LGBTQIA plus or sex and gender minor m minorities. So, um, excited to have that conversation and, and, and bring these things into the fold. And uh, we're just really thankful for all the people that have doubled the meeting time, canceled whatever Zoom meetings that you, competing Zoom meetings just to hang out with us. I'm thankful for that. So uh, thank thank everybody for for hanging out with us for a little bit a little bit longer. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ed. Thank you.